But ultimately, Stevie, that's four games in the last five in the Premier League that Liverpool have failed to pick up all three points. And that is the title race gone, surely, for Liverpool. Well, the, the truth is it was probably gone anyway. But any slim hopes, uh, no question, uh, have completely disappeared after after this draw. Um, I mean, it's tough to really turn around and say that, you know, Liverpool completely deserved the victory. They were the team that were pushing. No surprise, West Ham sitting deep trying to, to do them on the break. Um, I mean, the first half was pretty bad. I'll be honest, <laughs> there's no other way to put it. But clearly at half time, uh, Klopp's gotten into them. Uh, and I think, I think the loss to Everton. I think they started this game feeling a little bit sorry for themselves, mm. and I'm I'm pretty sure that that would be the message from Klopp: Don't be feeling sorry for sale. Get out and let's show what we're we're capable of. Um, and probably the way I've just said it was the nice way. I'm sure there was a few expletives involved in his language in that dressing room, and you could clearly see the start of the second half. This was a different side. And got themselves 2-1 ahead and, and deservedly went 2-1 ahead. And actually, I think the turning point of the game was McAllister's header that, that Ariola saved. Yeah. You know, McAllister, five yards out, six yards out. Not the easiest of headers, but just didn't quite get enough on it. And if that goes in, the game's, the game's over for me. Unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, and West Ham, being the home side... Got a little bit of momentum, and Liverpool again can't keep a can't keep the ball at the back of the net to save their life right now. Um, and the equaliser goes in and finishes two two. So disappointing all round. But as I said, it, it was slim. There was a slim chance that Liverpool could still win this title. No question, it's completely gone now. So you've summed up the game well. Let's go into it in a bit more detail. The opening goal, good header by Jared Bowen, but just like the Everton game, why have Liverpool suddenly become so susceptible to conceding from cross balls or set plays? Um, it's it's called attacking the ball. You know, it's one thing to hold a position, and everybody gets a everybody's given a, a starting position uh, on set pieces, corners, free kicks, whatever it may be. But after that, wherever the ball's delivered, you have to attack it. And right now, certainly in the last couple of games, there doesn't seem to be enough Liverpool players attacking the ball. Uh, and of course, when when Jared Bowen gets the opportunity, and it, I mean, he he was probably the smallest man in amongst all the giants. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a good header, and of course. Going in at one nil down at half time after a horrible performance, you're you're kind of scratching your head. I don't know what's been said at half time by Jurgen Klopp, but something's been said because he got a reaction. Mm. Will he be frustrated that he had to say something at half time after a, a first half where they had a lot of the ball, but they were pretty insipid. It was like they were on mm. the beach. That's annoying for Jurgen Klopp, is it not? That he has to do his work at half time. To tell his players this isn't good enough? Oh, frustrating, absolutely. Um, but I think I think we should understand that going forward, Liverpool's front three, regardless of who it's been, I mean, against Everton, you know, we're talking about Salah and Nunes being completely invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, today it was Gakpo, Elliott and Diaz. Other than, than Diaz, you know, again, in the attacking third of the field, there really wasn't anything happening. And as much as you said Liverpool had the ball, they never, they never created anything. Diaz hit the post in the first half. I, I think pretty much, if you want to call that a half chance, because it wasn't even that, mm. that was about it. But as we said, he gave them a rocket at half time, and it worked. It worked because Andy Robertson yeah. channeled his inner Stevie Nicol uh, as a fullback for Liverpool scoring a goal. Uh, good finish, took it nice and early. And then the, the turnaround at that stage was complete. A very scrappy goal. The effort, I think it was Gakpo. Mm -hmm. It kind of pinged around. It hit Ogbonna. It hit Socek. It went in off Areola. And Liverpool this season, coming into the game, have won 27 points from losing positions, which is great. Mm -hmm. The problem is they've been losing in the first instance. It's not often that they get themselves ahead having been behind and don't get the three points. So what right. happened between taking the lead at 2-1 and not getting all three points? 
they just went a little safe. Right. You know, you're away from home, uh, and West Ham haven't offered anything in the second half going forward. They've, they've pretty much been on the back foot. They've been defending. Uh, as I, as I said, that that great spell that started the probably the first half of the of the second half, where Liverpool really dominated and, and created some opportunities. Robertson had another shot saved uh, by Ariola, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the McAllister header. That's why I think the McAllister header header is huge because I do believe that the game was done. If that goes in, it, it doesn't, and then the game sort of starts drifting back towards West Ham. Liverpool go a little safe, don't keep their foot on the pedal. And the way Liverpool have been defending, you're never quite sure. Um, and the worst fears, certainly the worst fears I had watching this game was Liverpool going a little deep, a ball in the box, and then, mm. albeit a fantastic header from Mikel Antonio. And it's 2-2. Uh, and then they never really looked like like getting another goal either side after that. Yeah, there's still talking points. There's a, a Cody Gakpo Ariola incident I want to get to shortly. But just prior to Mikel Antonio's headed equaliser from Jared Bowen's cross, we already knew that uh, Mohamed Salah and Darwin Nunez were coming on. It wasn't until later on, towards the end of the game, that social media kind of said, hold on here, what's this? And there was a camera behind the goal that spotted a pretty heated argument between Mohamed Salah and Jurgen Klopp. Now, as we record, the final whistle's just gone, so we don't know what's been said. But what do you think to the relationship right now between Salah and Klopp? The fact that Salah didn't even start the game for the second time in, in three, and then you've got these visual pictures that they're arguing. We don't know what's been said, but it's not a good look, is it? Oh, it's not a good look. Um, but, I mean, let's be honest, Salah really can't have too much of a problem at not starting. Um, because since he's come back from his injury, he hasn't he hasn't done anything to, to, to say to Klopp that you need to start me. I need to be in this 11. I need to start these games. Because he hasn't produced. And at the end of the day, when you have other options and somebody is, is so far off what they normally are, then Salah can't, can't, on all honesty, have a go at Klopp for not playing him, not from the start. Um, listen, we don't, we don't know, as you said, what the, what the altercation was between the two. They certainly had words. But again, because they have words, I, I think it's too easy to, to look into it and, and look at the situation right now that Liverpool are in and, and, and try and pin a label on it as far as some sort of problem with the relationship. Um, things happen in the in the heat of the battle when the game's going on. Words are said. It's nothing new. Um, until it's anything else, I guess we should just put it down to a difference of opinion. Hmm. B bigger picture, Stevie. Mohamed Salah was playing well prior to going away to AFCON with Egypt. It's all hypotheticals, but if he'd come back having not been injured... Do you think the title race might be a three-horse race right now if Salah was maintaining the form he'd previously shown because he's clearly dropped off? That's a right hypothetical, that, by the way. It is. Listen, Liverpool, Liverpool haven't won games because they haven't, put, they haven't scored enough goals. Yes, we can talk about defensively they've let goals in, but going forward, uh, the, front, the front players, particularly Salah, haven't produced. No. When it's when it's needed most, you know, this time of the year is when it counts more than any. And Liverpool's forwards haven't produced. Whether it's Nunes, whether it's Salah, Diaz has looked lively, but he hasn't produced the numbers of goals that that we would hope for. So yeah, <laughs> you can't pin this on Salah. Listen, people lose form. Unfortunately for Salah, we don't expect him. Not to be at his best. He's been a, he's been so good for so long that you know at some stage he was going to have a little drop, but unfortunately that drop has come at the worst possible time for Liverpool, and obviously not just his form but the injury, which I would suggest has a lot to do with it. And I think you're right to say, look, it's not just Mohamed Salah. 
Darwin Nunez was brought in to score goals. He scored goals, but he's not scored anywhere near enough. He didn't start either. He also came on with Mohamed Salah. That was the first time today, by the way, that that lineup had been selected by Jurgen Klopp in the Premier League. He's making an average of five changes every game. When you won league titles, you could pretty much pick the team on a Friday. You knew who was playing. Is that an issue? Just too many changes because of whatever reason for Klopp this season? No, I don't. I, I wouldn't suggest that at all. You know, I think the fact that he has options. Well, that, that, actually, let me let me start again. Number one, when players are playing well, when players are are at their at their best, right? Then Klopp, like any other coach, is is going to play his best players, and sure. then he's going to try and look. He's going to try and look to give people a rest. I mean, that's generally how how it would work. But when you have options. And your so-called top players aren't producing, then you know you give them a little bit of rope, which he has done. And if they still don't produce, then you make changes. Uh, and I think, I think the results recently, the performances recently um, would suggest that I don't think anybody else would have done anything different than Klopp's done. You know, you you you're trying to find a, a remedy. You try to find an answer. And you're going to have to try different things. Uh, so I would suggest that the fact that it seems like he's made a lot of changes in the last couple of months, I think, is more down to do with with form, uh, certainly injuries a couple of months ago, uh, and those types of things. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't put this down to Klopp tinkering, shall we say? Hmm. Going to end with um, what. To us right now, before we've heard an explanation from PGMOL and the Premier League, is a contentious moment. You're always told, you'll tell your grandkids, you were told, we're all told, play to the whistle. Yep. So the ball comes in, whistle hasn't gone. Ariola's caught the ball. Still the whistle hasn't gone. We're, we're still active. The play is live. Ariola then rolls it out. And Gakpo, having not heard the whistle, is told, play to the whistle. So on he goes goes to pick the ball up, and then the referee, Anthony Taylor, is like, oh, and stops the play. Now, I know you said there's still a slim chance prior to this of Liverpool winning the title. If he goes and scores there, then there's there's chaos. Now, subsequently, Ariola gets treated. Was he hurt? I don't know, but he got treatment for whatever it was. Referee restarts the play with a drop ball. So what's happened here? as we sit without having had an explanation from PGMOL? Well, I think... <laughs> I was going to say I think it's pretty clear, but let me change oh, really? it to... I would, I would suggest that okay. the referee has not blown his whistle. Nope. Uh, Ariola has gotten up. Mm -hmm. he, he may have hurt his toe, he may have done something, I don't know, <laughs> but he's he's gotten up with the ball and he's thrown it down uh, to kick it. And I'm pretty sure Ariola thinks he's been given a free kick. But as you said, the whistle hasn't gone. Nope. Uh, and Gakpo, being alive, yeah. tries to take advantage of that and, and mm -hmm. has stopped in the middle of it, I'm assuming, by the referee. Otherwise, why would Gakpo have, Po have stopped? Because yep. he had his back to the referee. So I'm going to assume the referee must have had a little blow of his whistle. Otherwise, yep. why would Gakpo Eventually. stop? Yep. So, again, it's a little bit like the Gabriel situation um, not that long ago where he didn't hear the whistle, picked the ball up. It should have been a penalty. Uh, and it wasn't given. Uh, and the referee has let him off. And today, Anthony Taylor has mm. let Ariola off again which is professional football. It's not school kids. This isn't the playground. It should have been let go. The whistle hadn't gone. It's down to Areola to be clued in the way that Gakpo was. And so he should have been allowed to play on. This will be the same Anthony Taylor who, within the past week to 10 days, has been told that he will be one of England's two refereeing um, selections for the Euros but also the same Anthony Taylor that was in charge of Everton against Nottingham Forest and that viral tweet that went out by Nottingham Forest with regards to the statement. It's not a good look. It's not been a good week for Anthony Taylor, has it? No, not at all.
Not at all. <laughs> Where are we go?